Welcome to Pot Appetit Gourmet Takes, the podcast with hot takes on food media. We interview popular chefs and food personalities, sample all kinds of food media, and try cooking challenges in our own kitchens. Let's dig in. Hey, it's Justine. And it's me, Meg. Welcome back to another episode of Pod Appetit, where we cook themed recipes every month and chat about the latest food media we've been consuming. But before we get into the episode, we have a big announcement, a bittersweet announcement. This is the final episode of Pod Appetit. Sorry to jump scare you like that. <laughs> <laughs> Coming to you live from Hurricane Hillary, being swept away as you speak. <laughs> it's taken out all of our podcasting equipment and we just can't continue. No, in truth, our podcast has been going on for about four years now. And if you've been with us since the beginning, you know that Pot Appetit has gone through several different incarnations from the Halcyon Bon Appetit days to... <laughs> covering the Great British Break Off to what we have now. And through all those four years, we've enjoyed the heck out of every single iteration of the podcast. But there's time for everything. And we feel like Pod Appetit has reached the end of its little podcast life. <laughs> yeah. First of all, shout out to our most popular episode. <laughs> our Bon Appetit drama episodes, yes, yeah. by far our most popular by a lot because everyone loves the tea. Yes, so thank you for all 6,000 people who listened to that one. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you very much. If only, yeah. if only they were all still listening. <laughs> it's all good. It's all good. They, 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 they came for what they wanted and we were happy to supply. Um, man, those were the days, though. The the friggin' like Twitter community for BA, like we we we've had some really great moments meeting so many awesome people over the years, getting to talk with chefs uh, yes. who were our heroes. I mean, we accomplished so much. I am so proud of us. We I accomplished a lot. That. We had a great time. Like you said, those Reddit talks were really fun. Got to chat with. Clara Saffitz and Rick Martinez and Molly Baz mm -hmm. and Jay Kenji Lopez all and all sorts of really cool food personalities. And I enjoy just as much chatting with our listeners. So I really want to thank everyone who's been listening, especially if you've been with us for the long haul. We really appreciate your listenership and love hearing from you all over these years. And I hope that you enjoyed what we put out there. Yeah, and definitely on a personal note, I've learned so much from just doing this podcast. It was a goal of mine to basically learn how to cook, and I feel like I did. Like, I can just see videos of people making food on mute and know what they're doing. <laughs> I'm, I have superpowers now. <laughs> yeah, I've always felt like I've been a pretty competent cook, but Pot Appetit has really, because of the framework of our podcast, you know, like we cooked things from the shows we were watching or like we've been doing recently. We have these themed monthly cooking challenges. So trying to really seek out and approach recipes that I might not have chosen otherwise has been really fun. I've really tried to like challenge myself and make recipes I've never made before and make yeah. a bunch of different types of recipes. So that's been really awesome. And I'm sure that's something that I'll take forward in my personal life. Yeah. And honestly, Meg, I've looked up to you like through this. Oh. I always felt like I was like, Meg is like top tier like baker. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> I'm like, must take good photos. Must look good for Instagram. <laughs> that too. That too. Mucho accomplished photography. <laughs> well, you've been a big inspiration for me too, because over the course of our podcast, I've gone vegetarian and... I've learned a lot from you about how to make delicious vegan things. And as we'll get into, one of the recipes I made this episode is by some folks, some bloggers who Justine has <laughs> referenced before, which is one reason why I even sought out this recipe. So yeah, we learned a lot from each other as well. Yes. So yeah, keep listening. We've got a full menu. We do. And a bunch of disasters. Because <laughs> <laughs> we're going to end on a real fun one. And you know, on a real high note, all the disasters, all the time, <laughs> all the fails. Yes. Oh, boy. Yeah. So I guess let's get into it. For our August themes, we had National Peach Month, Grab Some Nuts Day, August 3rd. <laughs> <laughs> 
National Potato Day, which was August 19th, and National Toasted Marshmallow Day, August 30th. Oh, and there were, there was another day I forgot to add in there. What was it? Banana Lovers Day. I added a couple days, yeah. Banana Lovers Day was the 27th, and National Waffle Day was the 24th. And I'm going to talk about my National Waffle Day dish (laughs) first. (laughs) It's a real IHOP moment. Parks and Rex fans rejoice. (laughs) Waffle Day has arrived. Uh, Mm -hmm. But truthfully, I was not a waffle fan previously. But in this great year where I learned to make two different kinds of pancakes, I also learned how to buy a waffle maker. (laughs) (laughs) You went on over to Amazon and clicked a button. They're so much easier to make. Excuse you, I went to Target. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Love a Target. Yeah. So there's this chapter on waffles in whole food cooking every day that I've had my my eye on for some time. Of course, I've made so many things from this book. Um, and for this day, I made banana, cocoa, gluten-free vegan waffles, and I covered mm. them in syrup and blueberries and slivered almonds. Tasty. Yeah. What I love about this cookbook by Amy Chaplin is that most every chapter has like a base recipe, and then there are ways to like elevate the recipe. So you want to make almond milk? Great. You want to make rose strawberry almond milk? Here you go. You want to make nut butters? Here you go. If you want to add matcha and add, you know, and what to pair it with, great. It's it's a good book for that. So she has her base uh, vegan waffle recipe made with bananas because the non-vegan one is made with eggs. Mm. But there is so much, like, goodness in these. They're very, quote, quote, healthy. Um, there's almond milk, ground flax, almond flour, oat flour, millet flour, brown rice flour. Just name a few of the ingredients. That's too many flours. They're hearty. I I uh, made my own millet flour myself. Oh, wow. My millet. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Putting my spice grinder to use. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm like, I'm on a farm. This is, this is my own flour. That's how I cook. Next, you'll be churning your own butter. Oof. I mean, I have I done that yet? No. <laughs> Honestly, questioned myself there. So this added cocoa powder and cinnamon for flavor. And it isn't sweet at all. All of your sweetening comes from the toppings you choose. And, and that's really it. You just mix it all together. You're wet, you're dry. You put in your waffle maker. You learn how to use a waffle maker. <laughs> You throw the first one away because it doesn't work. Yes, always. And then you just make beautiful choco waffles. And, you know, she's got rose sesame waffles, orange blossom waffles, matcha cardamom waffles, which I hope to make one day. Oh, yeah. I love cardamom. I love this idea of taking a base recipe and then putting a bunch of spins on it. I think Sola Mm. had a little series of YouTube videos about that. It was just like, here's the recipe. And then here's how you can modify it to make it something completely different. Yeah. Um, I'd say Carla, Carla's cookbook, that sounds so good, does that. But I don't. (laughs) I feel like I've expressed my feelings about Carla's cookbook before. (laughs) Yeah, we we give it a pass, I suppose. (laughs) It's. It's on our it's on our bookshelves, but not in our kitchens, really. I don't know. It's true, but yeah, these waffles look very tasty. I love the fresh blueberries. I love maple syrup, real maple syrup. Yeah. Okay. Oh yeah. Okay, good. As long as it's real maple syrup. Grade A. <laughs> <laughs> Straight from the tree. Yeah, exactly. Uh, no, they're delicious. I actually like the batch. I think me. Make- eight so they store very well in the fridge to eat later Mm -hmm. so excellent a plus will make again good job christening your waffle iron thank you the smoke is normal (laughs) 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 all right uh oh what do you have next (laughs) we are revisiting grab some nuts day as soon as Justine added it to the holiday list, I had to do it. <laughs> and also, much like Justine, I went with peanuts because, as we talked about, yeah, we know they're legumes, but whatever. 
What ifs? Everyone likes peanut. <laughs> mm-hmm. So it was just my husband's birthday. He doesn't eat sweets, but you know, other people do. So you can't <laughs> have a birthday party without cake. It's just wrong. I made salty caramel peanut butter cake from the cookbook called Snacking Cakes by mm-hmm. Yasi Arefi. I've mentioned this cookbook several times. And I've made quite a few recipes, but I have to say this is probably my least favorite recipe from the cookbook that I've made so far. Like all the other recipes, it's very easy to make, which is great because it's just throwing a bunch of stuff in a bowl as you do and putting it in the oven, but nothing like fancy or anything. So the base cake is peanut butter and brown sugar. Those are probably the two main flavor profiles. It smelled wonderful when it was baking. Very strong peanut butter aroma. My kitchen still smells like peanut butter. But the flavor of the completed cake was not as peanut buttery as I thought it could have been. It's like, oh, I can detect the peanut butter. But if I were to make this one again, which I honestly probably won't, I would say put way more peanut butter in there. Also, Mm, interesting. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't super peanut-y. Also, the icing is a salted caramel icing. Again, you use a lot of brown sugar for the flavoring and some cream and flaky sea salt. So the icing isn't peanut butter flavored at all. It's this nice complimentary caramel flavor with some flaky sea salt on top. But I was wondering if maybe maybe going all in with the peanut butter might have been the way to go for this, like making the icing also peanut butter flavored. Overall, it was okay. I also thought the cake itself was a little bit dry. The crumbs certainly could have been moister. Yeah. So I was going to say, I'm like, it looks a bit dense. <laughs> yeah. And also the icing to peanut butter cake ratio, I'd say, was a little off. And maybe that's on me instead of the recipe. But the thing is, this is called snacking cakes because... The base recipes make a small cake. So yeah. if I had used the base recipe, it would have made like one eight inch cake pans uh, worth. But uh-huh. almost all the recipes give instructions for, oh, and if you want to do it for this type of cake pan, double the recipe, which is what it says for the for the bunk cake pan. Yeah. So I was like, well, I need to make a bigger cake because there's lots of people coming over. So I doubled it, put it in the bunt cake pan, but that gave a lot of cake, but kept like the icing ratio the same. So I think it would have been better if maybe I had made it like a layer cake or something like that. Cause, yeah, yeah, layer cake. Then there would have been more moistness from the icing and it would have helped balance out the cake a little bit. Like, so it was okay. I, I think it looked very nice. The aesthetics were very impressive, but not, eh, not the best cake. Yeah, and I think it's quite easy to make, like, a peanut butter drizzle. Mm -hmm. It can be done. (laughs) But yes, I would highly recommend other recipes from that same cookbook. Like, the lemon olive oil cake is amazing. Mm -hmm. I almost made that again for the birthday cake, but I was like, no, I should grab some nuts, (laughs) which is why I made this one. (laughs) Oh, yeah, that's another thing we can do now that the podcast is ending. We can do some repeats. (laughs) It's true. (laughs) All new all the time can get a bit uh, tiring. (laughs) I like trying new things food-wise and I guess just in general. But yeah, that is a drawback because if you're making recipes for the first time all the time, you never know if it's Mm going to be good or not. (laughs) And one way that you make a recipe really good is by making it more than once because you're like, oh, well, I'll change this about it the next time Mm -hmm. I make it. Yeah. Great. Uh, yeah. And shout out again to uh, Snacking Cakes. Yes. I'm sure I will continue to make many, many cakes from it. <laughs> like, I'm going to make many things from whole food cooking every day. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Our standards. <laughs> totally. All right. What do you have for us next? Oh, okay. Here's one. <sighs> well, okay. So I was picking out some heirloom tomatoes to arrive in my grocery box like it came and I was like oh yes perfect it's season it's August here we go um so I went looking for a recipe for them like Mm -hmm. I went that way heirloom tomatoes is fine a recipe so I went to my uh tried and true bakerita Uh and this is the first time bakerita has steered me wrong oh no (laughs) bakerita let you down (sighs) I know betrayal 
What I attempted to make was the pesto and heirloom tomato galette. Mm. I know I'm finally jumping on the galette <laughs> bandwagon. <laughs> Figures it's our last episode. <laughs> Better late than never, as they say. Yeah. Um, the problem with this recipe was the dough. Like, it could roll out, it could hold a shape, but any type of, like, folding and molding, it would dissolve like sand. It was like, <laughs> do you know Squand from the 90s? <laughs> Yes. It was like squand, like wet sand. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what eating this galette was like, like yummy, yummy sand. <laughs> you know, I just love a sandy texture for foods I'm going to eat. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was like a pesto tomato crumble. <laughs> <laughs> so the dough had almond flour, tapioca flour, ground flax, nutritional yeast, and coconut oil. So yeah, it tasted so it tasted like the toasty almonds, you know, after it was cooked. And then in it is it's a base regular pesto. Uh, I think in this one it said to use pecans for nuts, and I was just like, I've got pine nuts. Oh, yeah. I save them for pestos. Like I don't put them on my oatmeal. Like <laughs> it's just, it was so funny because the whole time Ravi was like, What's a galette? What's a galette? And then when I got to serving, I was like, This is not a galette. <laughs> like Imagine this, but bettered. Yes. Um, I don't know. Meg, have you taken a look at the picture? I have. You know, (laughs) I feel so bad when I see a photo and I think that doesn't look quite right. But then every time I've thought that you, you are very, you're a very self-aware baker. And every time I've thought that, lo and behold, when we get into the episode, you're like, yeah, so this doesn't turn out. And here's why. (laughs) And I will say when I saw the picture, I'm like, that crust looks interesting looks looks a bit free form <laughs> oh that's that's a good it's a good descriptor to you <laughs> <laughs> but now i understand but you know i'm glad that you were able to give the pesto queen title one last hurrah in our final episode yeah i know i haven't made pesto in a while it felt good like pesto of course came out great yes tomatoes yummy all together uh, with sand <laughs> <laughs> the thing that would make me sad about this is that I love a good fresh heirloom tomato and it would make me really sad if if like the crust like diminished the tomato-ness. Mm, I don't know. It was fine. Yeah. Everything everything was fine. It was just I was so sad. I was so disappointed. I mean, look at the photo of hers. That is like look it has edges it has folds yes you can tell where it folded in her photo as intended i suppose mine looks like a crater (laughs) (laughs) i will say Um, i haven't made this recipe so i can't fully endorse it but there's this recipe developer i like named erin Jeannie mcdowell and she recently came out with a cookbook called Savory Baking, which is a mm. cookbook that I have purchased but haven't made anything from. But she posted a recipe earlier this month called Easy Tomato Galette with Parmesan Crust. So that might be a good recipe to explore instead, maybe. But again, I haven't made it, so it just looks good. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. I like, ugh, I, ugh. will I give Galettes another chance? Who knows? <laughs> Give Galettes a chance. (laughs) Or you're jumping right off the bandwagon. You jumped on, jumped right off again. I jumped on, I burned the bandwagon, (laughs) and then jumped off of it. I said, whoopsie. (laughs) Well, speaking of fails. Yes, let's keep this fail train (laughs) rolling. Never have I been more excited. (laughs) So this is the long-awaited multi-course, multi-stage failure that I've been alluding to for the last several several episodes. <laughs> I attempted in order to celebrate toasted marshmallow day to make homemade marshmallows. <laughs> These are one of those things that I've always wanted to try to make because I love marshmallows and I especially wanted to try to make them because since I am eating vegetarian now and I love marshmallows and traditional marshmallows have gelatin, I've really missed marshmallows. So I thought to myself, Mm -hmm. well, if I could somewhat easily make my own gelatin-free marshmallows at home, wouldn't that be great? (laughs) So, uh, yes, enter the disaster marshmallow saga. Part one. (laughs) Part one were vegetarian marshmallows by 
the Marshmallowist. And the Marshmallowist wow. is a marshmallow shop in London. I had marshmallows there and they were delicious. Their standard marshmallows aren't vegetarian, but since I had had their marshmallows before and thought they were great, I thought I could trust this recipe. <laughs> so where I think I went wrong on this, it, the recipe calls for agar powder and I used agar flakes. Uh-oh. And full disclosure, I, I simply did not do as much research as I needed to or should have before making this recipe. So the recipe said agar powder. I used agar flakes, and I just did a one-to-one substitution, which does not work. <laughs> what I've come to learn is that approximately one teaspoon of agar powder is equivalent to one tablespoon of agar flakes. Whoa. So I did not use nearly enough agar flakes as I should have. So I think that was mistake number one. Mistake number two, the recipe called for guar gum, which is mm-hmm. something that I don't have. And I was like, well, it's just a little bit of guar gum. Like, how necessary could it be? So I just <laughs> omitted that entirely. <laughs> uh, mistake number three. It, the recipe called for <laughs> glucose syrup. So oh this is a British UK recipe. And you know how sometimes they have slightly different words for mm-hmm. certain ingredients. So I was like, oh, glucose syrup. What, is, what does that mean? You know, and I tried to find what that meant. And I was like, well, I have this liquid glucose. Surely liquid glucose is the same thing as liquid syrup. but Or glucose syrup, I mean. But uh, it's not. <laughs> what are either of those things? Well, that's the thing. Like any sort of glucose syrup or liquid glucose, it is... It's all glucose, but it's, <laughs> it's like, created differently. So, like, the texture is different. The ratio is different than you would use in other recipes. What I came to determine is that I'm pretty sure glucose syrup to us in America is corn syrup. So oh. this is where I should have done more research is that as I looked at other marshmallow recipes, it became very apparent that corn syrup is used in like every marshmallow recipe. Oh. So I should have just used corn syrup is what I should have done. But I started making these. At first, they seemed great. Like I had these nice stiff peaks in the food mixer. And the thing is like you, some marshmallow recipes have egg whites, some don't, some are just sugar that you whip up a lot. But basically the step is you have your firming agent, so gelatin or agar or something like that. You heat sugar on the stovetop to softball stage. So it's like corn syrup, uh, regular sugar and water. And, and then you slowly drizzle that into your food mixer and whip it up. And then you get this whippy marshmallow fluff you mm. pour it into your pan or your mold or whatever, and, the, and then you let it set for several hours, uh, sometimes up to overnight. So that's like the basic steps for most marshmallow recipes. So this seemed good at first. I like poured it into the pan and I was like, all right, time to let it set up overnight. And then the next day I like flipped it out of the pan and it just, just like, it just gooshed everywhere. It was just Gush. like, it was like a little flow of marshmallow. It was obviously completely wrong it was foamy it was wet it was like toothpaste lather like it didn't really (laughs) hold like a form at all i've included photos it looks really gross check out our sub stack if you want to see the photos but it's just completely insubstantial it was just foam it was awful so did you you see that try guys you did when they made boba. Yes. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then there's a scientific term for that, like state between like that liquid and solid. <laughs> oh, non Newtonian. Yes, yes. I. <laughs> That's what you invented. <laughs> you know, honestly, I think that my last attempt was more non Newtonian, but I'll get to that in a moment. <laughs> oh. So yeah, that was attempt number one. Uh, attempt number two. I decided, stupidly, (laughs) I was like, okay, what I'm going to do this time is I'm going to take a recipe that calls for gelatin, and I'm just going to substitute the gelatin for agar flakes, and I'll do all the rest of the recipe the same. And so this presented difficulties because there's not a real clear formula for what the ratio of substitution should be for gelatin to agar flakes. It Like I, but I got like a general idea, you know. So I looked at this recipe for marshmallows by King Arthur Baking Company, 
And I was like that meme of that blonde lady who's like squinting and all the like calculations are like appearing mm. in front of her, you know. So I was like, how much agar flakes should I use? I ended up putting in about six tablespoons of agar flakes. And I'm just like, this is a lot. <laughs> but I'm like, it's fine. But what I think went wrong here is that usually in order to get agar to activate, you have to combine it with water and then heat it to a high temperature, usually to boiling, and have it boil or be near a boil for about three to four minutes. And that's how you activate the kind of gelling nature of agar powder or agar flakes. And this recipe didn't really have that step. You had the agar Mm. flakes with room temperature water in your stand mixer. And then the only heat that gets added to it is when you pour in the hot sugar syrup. So I think that that just like was not enough to activate or fully dissolve the agar flakes. So I had the agar and the water in the stand mixer, and then I added the sugar syrup and it was just pathetic. It was just, it just remained liquid the whole time. Mm. That, that was a step where you're supposed to beat it for about eight to 10 minutes. And then you get these nice stiff peaks but it went the full 10 minutes and it was just water. It was it was just water. And I was like, ah, and I was so frustrated. I didn't take a photo. So there's <laughs> there are no photos of that. And because there was so much agar and agar is derived from algae, it had this sort of like murky, oceany scent in a way that I don't want my marshmallows to smell like. Ooh. So it was just a complete and utter failure. <laughs> Man, there's so much science. Like, I'm like, okay, so marshmallows are really like solid, fluffy jello. <laughs> kind of, yeah, in a way, for sure. <laughs> wow. And also, hearkening back to a past season, there is a whole Anne Reardon video in which she uses marshmallow root, which is actually how marshmallows got started. There's this plant called the marshmallow, and mm. the root has this kind of a uh, marshmallowy quality in the sense that if you use it in cooking, you get this sort of jello-y, spongy, chewy thing. It's an interesting video. Uh, I would recommend people watch it. But yeah, so my third and final attempt was kind of a success, sort of. So for this third attempt, I was like, okay, no more substitutions. I Just, just get a recipe and follow it. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, I'll learn my lesson eventually. So... I got this recipe from Make It Dairy Free. This is food bloggers that Justine is familiar with. It is their vegan marshmallow recipe. At this point, I decided to get agar powder instead of flakes because flakes just seem a little bit more difficult to work with. So this recipe called for agar powder and aquafaba, Mm -hmm. which is the egg white substitute. I followed the recipe. (laughs) You can see from the photos that, like, they look like marshmallows um, or, yeah. or like tofu. I don't know. what I like big slabs of marshmallows, which is why I cut them so big. I could have made them look more like your standard marshmallows, but I love big squares of marshmallow. So They look like the ones on, on their site. Yeah. Their pictures. Yeah, they look good. They were interesting. I felt like these were the most non-Newtonian because they felt like marshmallows. You could, like, squish them like marshmallows. But the moment you took a bite... It did not have the mouthfeel of marshmallow. It, it was very <laughs> mushy. I shared this with um, my parents and with guests that we had over for the birthday party. And everyone was in agreement that, like, they tasted good and they looked like marshmallows. But the consistency was not marshmallow consistency. My dad called them mushmallows, which I think it was appropriate. I I want to say that I made it correctly and maybe this is the result. I don't think I messed anything up. I think that this is just how this particular type of vegan marshmallow is. They did say to use three to four teaspoons of gelatin powder, depending on how firm you wanted the marshmallow. So I was like, all right, I'm going to go right down the middle. I'm going to do three and a half teaspoons. And I was thinking, well, maybe I should have done four. Maybe I would have gotten that nice, bouncy, chewy marshmallow texture that I like so much. So anyway, that's been my marshmallow saga. At the end, I'm like, I guess it turned out okay. I'm glad I challenged myself. I'm glad I came up with something edible at the end. The other two yeah. recipes weren't even edible. So uh, at least I achieved that. 
is attempt four walk to the store and buy dandies. Yes, I. That's exactly it. <laughs> dandies exist. Dandies taste great. Dandies are vegan, and they have that marshmallow texture that I love so much. So, <laughs> we were talking about in our previous episodes that there's certain foods that just it's just not worth it to make at home because. It's too time consuming or costs too much or is just the same as something you can get at the store. And yeah, I have to say in this case, it's dandies all the way. Yeah. <laughs> dandies forever. <laughs> wow. You know what? I have thought in the past also of making, you know, my own marshmallows. Because mm-hmm. like, yeah, every site has them. And I feel like you just like saved me. <laughs> <laughs> I would say, yeah, not worth the effort. Just get dandies. It's fine. <laughs> Uh, well, do you have a success story for us next, hopefully? Do I have a success story? <laughs> kind of? <laughs> <laughs> so I wanted to find something for Banana Lovers Day, because we're the last two banana lovers on this pod. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Shout out. Isn't our first was our first episode banana phobia? I think it is. I think you're right. Full circle. Bringing it full circle. <laughs> Um, also, I feel like the universe has been wanting me to make millionaires for a while Hmm. now. I don't know if that happens to you or just something will show up in your feed or wherever for multiple times and you're like, it's speaking to me. For me, (laughs) that thing was millionaires. Got it. The algorithm gotcha. (laughs) Yeah. So I found Vegan Banafi Millionaires Shortbread by Addicted to Dates. Now, Banafi or (laughs) Banafi... Is a portmanteau of bananas and toffee, you know, by oh, Brits. You know, I didn't know that because I'd never really looked closely at the recipe. I looked it up last night because <laughs> I was like, Meg's going to ask me what this means. <laughs> you know, I've I heard it know. a million times on Jabibo, and I guess I was just never curious enough to know why. So I think this is a traditional sort of millionaire's bar uh, recipe, except there are bananas in the middle. Uh, which I will say is a choice. (laughs) (laughs) Now, the problem I had with this recipe, it was super not enough for my pan. Like the shortbread didn't go to the edges. The two bananas only filled like half. The peanut butter toffee layer wasn't thick like it is in the picture. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It just like barely covered everything. Like these came out rough. (laughs) (laughs) Again. (laughs) Oh, my God. Oh, no. The shortbread was good. It was gluten-free flour, almond flour, vegan butter, maple syrup. You make it in a food processor till it becomes dough, which it does, and then just mold it into your pan to bake. Um, And then you're supposed to, once that cools, do a layer of banana coins. And then to make the, quote, caramel, you mix in your food processor peanut butter, maple syrup, coconut oil, and some canned coconut milk with vanilla extract. It just mixes it all together for you. It doesn't do anything special. (laughs) Like I said, that didn't sit on top of my meager banana layer. So you can imagine it just becomes like super lumpy and then just like falls off. And while the shortbread doesn't even go to like the full sides of my eight by eight pan. Uh And I'm just like, so the last step, which is just melting, you know, your baking chocolate spread on top. I like doubled that so that I could just like cover it and make sure all my crevices were covered. (laughs) <laughs> gotta cover your crevices <laughs> yeah um so yeah you just basically the only baking part was the shortbread let it cool add the layer of bananas add that uh banana uh, add that peanut butter quote caramel and then the chocolate you could just melt in your microwave on top put it in the fridge for like 40 minutes let it harden cut the taste was good mm-hmm but I think even maybe better without the bananas. Like, it's fine with the bananas. You're just like, and then, like, literally, you buy it, and you're like, that's a choice. Yeah. But that's half the portmanteau. In. I know, but it's not like the flavors don't go together. It's just kind of this weird, squishy thing in the middle of, mm. like, the hard chocolate and, and a shortbread. Yeah. <laughs> it's a texture thing, mm-hmm, you know? Mm-hmm. Luckily, again, I, I have half of it that don't have bananas in it, even <laughs> though Happy Banana Lover's Day. I was like, eh. <laughs> I guess you I won't be, be the poster child for a banana day. I'm sorry, I tried. <laughs> <laughs> you can see in the pictures that 
like the banana layer is literally touching like the top chocolate layer. Yes. Like look at the picture of the layers of the what it's supposed to look like. <laughs> That's uh yeah, I feel like maybe their photo is like false advertising or something. Yeah, or they use like a loaf pan. I would suggest use a loaf pan instead. Oh to yeah, actually. Mm-hmm. That's a good idea. That would be, you know, A, my one suggestion. Uh, B, if you don't like bananas, easily leave it out. And it's like a, like a Twix bar kind of thing. Oh, okay. Yeah, I can see that. Ooh, homemade yeah. Twix bar. It suddenly sounds a lot better to me now that you've made that analogy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but now imagine Twix bar with, like, bananas. <laughs> yeah, okay. I Okay, I'm fully behind you now. I, okay. You've painted the picture, and I agree now. <laughs> It's a choice. <laughs> have you made other recipes by Addicted States? I feel like I have. I can't think of them on the top of my head, but it's it sounds familiar. Yeah, well, they can't all be winners. They can't all be winners, but I mean, like I said, it was they look quote rough and ready, but they're fine. <laughs> they're good. Yeah, they'll get eaten. The pictures on, on their site just look so gosh darn cute. They do. They they truly do. And then look at mine. (laughs) (sighs) Everything will be fine. I'm sure they taste wonderful. All right. Speaking of tasting wonderful, Meg. (laughs) Yes, I needed to have some sort of success story for Toasted Marshmallow Day. So I decided to make a s'mores martini. (laughs) This was one of the cocktail recipes that I write on a monthly basis for freelance work. I've, for the last several months, been doing a series of Zodiac-themed cocktails and kicking myself because this was my idea. I was like, hey, wouldn't it be cool to have Zodiac-themed cocktails? And the blog owner said, yeah, go for it. And now I've committed myself to a year of bullshitting about astrology because I don't know anything about signs or zodiac and I'm like what have I done yeah what have you done (laughs) astrology is not your thing (laughs) Uh, I'm trying my best is what is happening so this is the cocktail I made for Leo Leo is a fire sign Leo is in the middle of summer and apparently Leos have an inner child that they like to release. So I thought that oh. s'mores checked all of those boxes. S'mores are very summery. It's a very, like, childhood nostalgia thing. And, you know, fire sign, fiery toasted marshmallows. It works. Why not? <laughs> it's a pretty simple recipe. It's basically a chocolate martini with a few extra things. It's got marshmallow vodka, chocolate cream liqueur, and half and half, and then... You rim the glass with marshmallow fluff and graham crackers. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so it's pretty much s'mores in a glass. I think it was very tasty. I was very happy with it. And I got to use my brand new kitchen torch to torch those marshmallows. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I can see the how they get more torched and then more torched. <laughs> I wanted to take a nice photo of, like, smoke, like, coming off the marshmallow. So there's a few pictures where those those marshmallows are kind of, like, just the side of charcoal briquettes. But, you know, some people like them that way. <laughs> so if you want to try a s'mores martini, I suggest you check it out. It's definitely a dessert cocktail. It's very sweet. It's much sweeter than I usually tend to choose for myself but you know sometimes you just want a chocolate cocktail and it's very velvety and I like that you have the crunchy kind of malty graham crackers on the rim to sort of balance it out a little bit yes your main photo like your indoor photos look straight out of a magazine (laughs) like girl what is your lighting setup it's mother nature baby (laughs) Damn. I, Where you live in, there is perfect uh, sun all the time. I wait for a little bit before golden hour. I feel like that's that's how I find my light, find my angles <laughs> for my food shots. Great. When you get to Aquarius, remember all, <laughs> all like astrology things about Aquarians. They say aliens. We are aliens. Okay. So you, as an Aquarius, what would you drink? I know you don't drink, but let's say you did. <laughs> I feel like, okay, I think it has to be something purple. Oh, okay. Okay. I've got purple gin. I can make that work. Yes. 
something. Give me purple shimmers, and I feel like that's Aquarius. I'll do it. Vibes. I'll do it just for you. Yes. <laughs> okay, Justine, what's your final recipe? Oh my god. Oh my god. So I made coconut rice pudding with nectarines and peaches from Afro Vegan by Bryant Terry. This is a cookbook that I own. Um, it's National Peach Month. The original recipe actually has more nectarines and peaches, so I just flipped them. Mm -hmm. Totally fine. Uh, they're they're both in there. It's just I think in the recipe itself, there's like two peaches, five nectarines, and I just like blah blah blah. It's peach time. Yeah, yeah totally. Yeah. So the one semi annoying thing about this recipe is that you have to make creamed cashews, mm. which then leads you to another recipe in the book. And all for it to really just be a substitute for heavy cream. And also that recipe has you making one cup, uh, but the rice pudding only needs a fourth a cup. So the suggestion is basically just use the rest in a smoothie. <laughs> it's, it's, I'm not saying it didn't taste good, but it's just like some of those trails that you lead on, you're like, come on. Yes. <laughs> also, I want a recipe that makes the right amount, you know? Mm -hmm. I'm like, I don't know what yeah. to do with leftovers sometimes. And it wasn't used, as far as I could tell, in any other recipes in the book. Oh, wow. Okay. Yes. Very weird. Um, but the half a cup of white basmati rice needed to be soaked overnight anyway, so I soaked the cashews as well. That's fine. Um, overall, I would say, actually, this recipe made more than what I was expecting, <laughs> which is <laughs> opposite of what's happening to me lately. Mm -hmm. Um, I actually didn't use all the nectarines because um, there are cup measurements as well. It like estimates like you use five of these and then get two and a half cups or whatever. But I, I must have had some giant nectarines and peaches because like when I was cutting them up, I was like, dang, this is a lot. Mm, yes. <laughs> so you don't have to use all of what it says. Use what you need. It'll be fine. Um, but also what is the serving size of rice pudding because this thing said it made four servings and i think i don't know i think rice pudding i think small mm -hmm. yeah i think like like ice cream scoop size yeah i think this was big big servings <laughs> so anywho you take water and dissolve in sugar and salt in a saucepan add vanilla bean paste and the pot and bring to a boil as you're dissolving um and then add in the rice the soaked rice just mm -hmm. itself and simmer for about 15 minutes to cook the rice and then add in the coconut milk and the cashew cream and keep simmering till it's thick like a porridge it says mm -hmm. and that's when when that's done then you get to cool that so meanwhile you're going to take two diced peaches put them in a blender with lemon juice lemon zest water sugar cinnamon and salt and blend that until smooth and then dice five more nectarines and peaches or like i said as many as you can handle <laughs> and add that to a bowl and then mix in that smooth peach goo like you just stir mm. it all together mm -hmm. so you get like the solid bits and the liquidy bits <laughs> basically you're just gonna make sure everything is chilled before serving and you could do layers like i did layer of the coconut rice layer of the, the peaches and nectarines layer layer mm -hmm. it's like a little parfait yeah it's very, very tasty, very flavorful. I love the vanilla coconut with the sweet fruit. Um, there's a mango sticky rice I get at a Thai place, and it, I felt like very similar vibes. Like, this satisfies that itch where I don't have to, like, order out. I can mm -hmm. make it because the, the I think the coconut rice portion was pretty easy to make. You're just basically adding rice and adding coconut yeah, milk yes. mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> and sugar, you know? But, yeah, I think... The chopping of, like, the six or seven slippery peaches is the top part. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this looks really good. I love a coconut sticky rice. And those bright peaches just look delightful. It looks like it looks like the inside of a uh, peach cobbler minus the cobble part. Yeah. Really tasty. I guess my question for this is the, the cashew part really just seems unnecessary, yeah? Because, I mean, coconut sticky rice... You don't really need to make any substitutions. It's coconut milk and, and rice. And I just, do you feel like the cashews added anything really? I don't think so. I think it was just really for thickness. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, it said to replace with heavy cream, but I do that all the time with thick uh, coconut yeah. milk anyway. Totally. So I I don't think so. I don't know. I bet you could make this recipe without that extra step and all the extra cashew nonsense and probably be really good still. Yeah, for sure. I will say it's interesting. Like once you've like cooled the, the rice for a bit, it then kind of becomes scoopable like ice cream yeah. you know <laughs> it looks it looks like a parfait it looks like a little ice cream parfait yeah it was uh i think delicious light and summery i think definitely you know i i, I geared towards eating this more than the the banafi millionaires because even the millionaires are just very sugary like i t- take off like a little a little bit mm-hmm. and eat yeah <laughs> but this I, I don't feel bad about taking like a small cup you know yeah w- was it very sweet i know that a lot of times you get the thick sticky rice from the sugar because the, often you like cook down the sugar or get this like sugary syrup to make it sticky no i wouldn't say it was too overly sweet like i was getting just more of that coconut and vanilla rather than it being like cloyingly sweet Mm -hmm. if anything the sweetness comes from like the 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 fruit and the sugar you add there which i think you could totally cut if you wanted to yeah it looks great yay i made something successfully (laughs) nom 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 (laughs) see that's why i had to just keep going until something came out good (laughs) cook your way through it yeah all right one last thing from Meg. <laughs> One last time. <laughs> crying, crying. <laughs> oh, oh, no. No, she really is. Okay, stop it. I can't look at the Zoom video now. Okay. No, no, no tears. I'm just going to push through. Whew, okay. <laughs> so I was a bad vegetarian and made salmon. <laughs> So sometimes Trader Joe's has these recipe contests. I mentioned one Mm. before where they had a corn recipe contest and I made elote corn muffins. For this month, they had, what did they call it? It was something silly. Um, Oh, yeah. For this month, they had Trader Joe's burger bonanza (laughs) recipe contest. (laughs) And I wasn't really planning on entering it because I was like, oh, it's a burger. I don't really eat beef burgers. But then I had this idea. I was like, oh, what if I tried to mimic a poke bowl, but in a burger? And I just thought it was too good of an idea to, you know, to pat myself on the back a little bit. I was like, this is a really good idea. I have to make it. My apologies to the salmon. (laughs) Something fun and challenging about Trader Joe's recipe contest is that it has to be seven or fewer ingredients total Mm -hmm. and they all have to be trader joe's ingredients right yes so for this one i have three components it's the salmon burger rice bun patties instead of like a bread patty or or a bread bun i should say (laughs) and then i made a sort of edamame mayo kind of like fresh relish sort of thing on top the ingredients i used were salmon panko mayo trader joe's yuzu hot sauce which is really good by the way Trader Joe's rice, their brand of furikake and edamame. I thought it turned out great. The salmon burgers are very moist. I feel like that's always something you have to look out for in salmon burgers and turkey burgers because, well, turkey especially, turkey's not as Mm -hmm. fat as beef and you need that fattiness to get a nice moist burger. This particular cut of salmon I had was very fatty, so it created a nice, soft, moist burger patty and I added mayo to it as well that was basically the salmon burger also some hot sauce in there I was really proud of the rice buns because I wasn't sure if it was gonna work (laughs) I'm like this is just gonna like fall apart you know so you cook up your rice you wait for it to cool and then what I did was I lined a ramekin with cling wrap spooned the rice in there and just pressed it down really, really firmly with the back of a spoon so that you have a nice, firm, compacted rice patty. And you turn that out of the ramekin. And then kind of the key is to sort of like handle it as little as possible. So you have this nice, firm, packed in 
rice patty. You put it on a nonstick skillet and cook it about six to eight minutes per side. So like don't flip it too much when it gets a nice sort of like crispiness in the pan. And it does hold together. I was surprised. It made an actual burger. It didn't really fall apart until like the last couple bites where there wasn't quite as much structural integrity, but it worked out really well. And then I had the edamame also combined with some mayo and some more of that yuzu hot sauce to make it a little bit spicy. And then furikake in with the rice as well. So I was just like, it's a poke bowl, but a burger. You broke my brain. I thought that edamame was lettuce. Oh, (laughs) no, it's just mushed up edamame. I like roughly mashed it with a fork and stirred it up with mayo and yuzu hot sauce. (laughs) Wow. I can say, though, I'm pretty sure at this point that I didn't win any of the prizes in the contest because they said that they were going to start notifying people on August 17th, and that was like three days ago. So I don't think I won. By the time this episode airs, I'll know for sure whether I won or Mm. lost, but it's probably a no, which is too bad. I'm sorry, Salmon, that you died in vain, but it was a very tasty dinner. So there's that at least. (laughs) Thank you, Salmon. Thank you, Salmon. This, I was just like, okay, if you like squint and like look far away, you're like, okay, filet of fish. <laughs> <laughs> but then like, yeah, it's the details that are, are like I said, I was like, the edamame looks like lettuce. <laughs> the, the rice buns themselves kind of have like a hue of looking like um english muffins <laughs> <laughs> so it's like an optical illusion burger yes perfect <laughs> i always want my recipes to be confusing <laughs> <laughs> i'm just saying when you look up close it'll keep you it'll... on your toes for sure <laughs> In retrospect, I wish I had styled it a little bit differently. I was like, oh, I should have put it on this sushi display platter thing that I have, and I should have put chopsticks next to it or something to evoke a poke bowl a bit more. But, you know, hindsight and all that. Spicy yuzu edamame mayo. Mm -hmm. You are on the cutting edge. (laughs) We'll see. I have yet to win any of these contests. As you're sipping your s'mores cocktail. (laughs) Mm, I don't think that'd be a very good pairing. (laughs) One is, okay, that's the day and night, like. <laughs> yes. Congrats already. I like. I love when you invent things. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's fun. Well, you know, you can see my Zodiac cocktail inventions for the next year. <laughs> <laughs> I'm cackling because I'm like, oh, yes, you, you are torturing yourself. <laughs> well, we're not torturing ourselves anymore in the kitchen. <laughs> oh, my fucking God. <laughs> kitchen is the closed. kitchen is closed <laughs> until next time no. the kitchen is <laughs> so dramatic so i'm gonna make her cry again so dramatic we got we got media we have we media. Got media all right time to move on to the food media we've been consuming with our eyeballs <laughs> eyeballs and our ear holes maybe you too Mm -hmm. I'll start us off. I found a zine. I feel like zines are making a comeback along with blogs. I feel like the era of long form writing is making a comeback. I hope anyway. This is a zine called Cake Zine, and it describes itself as an independent print magazine exploring society through sweets. So each volume has a collection of recipes, illustrations, essays, poems, short stories, etc., The first volume was about cake, as one might imagine. The second volume was also about cake and included a recipe from Sola El Whaley for her own death by chocolate cake. This Mm. is a pretty new zine. I have only seen excerpts from the first two volumes online, but I decided to buy the third volume, which is about pies. This one was called Humble Pie. And the reason why I decided to get this one was that They had a recipe for savory spam musubi pie that looked very intriguing to me. And I found that great spam substitute that I love, Omni Pork. So I was drawn in by the spam musubi pie and decided to buy this volume. I haven't read all of it yet, but I've enjoyed what I have read so far. It's a very quirky and eclectic, and it's just kind of fun to read 
it's fun to see what's in the cultural atmosphere as far as food trends and food writing goes. So anyway, yeah, I enjoyed it. I would recommend checking out their Instagram, which is also just cake zine. They post a lot of the full recipes without needing to actually buy a print version. But you know, it's cool. If you like it, consider buying a volume to support them. Cool. (laughs) Very punk rock. Yes, totally. (laughs) Well, um, my media is just kind of this thing that's just been in my eyes that I'm intrigued with. And they are meringue cookies (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) but like this sort of meringue art where I I just watch these Instagram reels where people just make like kitty cats and Winnie the Pooh characters and Jigglypuff (laughs) like out of meringue and to me it's just like magic and I feel like it's not just I I shared this one account to Mm -hmm. you I don't think it's it's not just this one person doing it but, like, I think this is the one that's come up in my feed the most. They make them, like, on top of these cookies, mm-hmm. these golden cookies. Um, so that's why they're meringue cookies. Um, maybe it's just because, I don't know, diddly squat about meringue. But, like, to me, I'm like, how are you sculpting little kitty paws? <laughs> right. And, like, how? Magic. <laughs> yeah, these looked really cool. I checked out that account that you linked to me. And it they said it was Swiss meringue. And, you know, I don't know off the top of my head the major differences between the different type of meringues but it almost looked like they were kind of using a what I would call like a royal icing technique the way that they were Mm. layering the meringue I often see that type of technique used with royal icing instead yeah it's really interesting very sculptural looking my question and I don't know if you can answer this or not but like they look so beautiful But I wonder if they are baked in the end, because a lot of times when you bake a meringue, it like loses the vibrant color when it's cooked. And I was like, I almost think that maybe these are meringues that are just set at room temperature and not baked. But I don't know if that's a thing. Anyway, yeah, I'm curious about this trend. It's very interesting, very creative. Yeah, because I only ever see them go from like glossy to like matte. Yes. Mm hmm. I don't know if they're, I'm like, I don't know the mysteries of it. I just know that I want to squish them. <laughs> I know. Maybe they're cooked at, like, a very low temperature, and then that does let them set without, like, changing the color too much, maybe. Yeah, because I assume this person, like, sells them. They're a bakery, mm-hmm, so they got to mm-hmm. be edible. But, yeah, too cute. I'm enthralled. I'm spending way too many time, to- way too much time on Instagram reels. And this, yeah, that's that's my thing. I have discovered magic, and it's right. <laughs> nice. Like a little Gudetama. Oh, I love Gudetama. Well, maybe <laughs> you could link buns. some in our Instagram stories so people can check yeah. out that account too. I will. Nice. <laughs> There's one last food media thing I wanted to mention. Going back to food writing, I guess I'm just in a food writing zone at the moment. There is a collection called The Best American Food Writing. It's been coming out since 2018. Basically, it's a collection of exemplary food writing for the past year. It's put together by the lead editor, Sylvia Killingsworth, and she seems to have a sort of rotating uh, cast of, I don't know, like guest editors or associate editors. And for the most recent collection, the 2022 collection, Sola L. Wiley is the guest editor, and she also writes the foreword. So Sola's been doing a lot of food writing as well. I just enjoy seeing how it's kind of like a snapshot of what was, what everyone was talking about food-wise during that year, or not even necessarily what everyone was talking about, because some of these more interesting essays are like, you know, niche things you might not have heard of. You get a lot of different perspectives. I haven't read the 2022 collection yet, but I've started reading the inaugural collection, which was from 2018. And yeah, I'm also really enjoying this as well. A lot of different perspectives, a lot of different personalities. And yeah, there's a lot more out there when it comes to food writing than just uh, stories about how recipes were created. Like there's a lot of interesting societal things that go along with it. But you know, That's what we've been talking about our whole podcast, essentially, especially when it comes to shows like uh, Padma Lakshmi's Taste the Nation and things like that. There's just there's all these human stories that come along with food. And that's what a lot of this best American food writing is about. 
Yeah. And I see friend of the pod, J. Kenji Lopez Alt, he did 2020. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a lot of recognizable and names. And Samin! Yes, Samin as well. <laughs> Samin Nosrat has been one of the guest editors also. Ugh. Samin's my white whale of guests that we never got. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I, I also just met someone who's like, two degrees away from Samin and I was like please talk to her and she's like I don't have her phone number and I'm like yes but you could oh my god Uh, that'll be when we come back for a surprise (laughs) guest interview with Samin Nasrat I mean her and Rishi come back for surprise uh episodes of home cooking it's true Well, is that going to do it for our episode and our podcast, Justine? Ah! <laughs> well, yes. Ugh, that is that is the end. I know. What is what a great episode to end with, and I don't know all the things we set up at the top. Yeah, yeah. Just to say again, thank you for listening. Thank you, Justine, for being my co-host. Oh, thank you, Peg. <laughs> Shout out to those old Lady Pod Squad days oh, yes. bringing us together. <laughs> Hashtag Lady Pod Squad. Oh. Yeah. All right. Well, we're hanging up our aprons. The kitchen is closed. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thanks for listening to Pod Appetit Gourmet Takes. Go to podappetitpodcast.com for all our episodes and links to everywhere you can find us online. Also, be sure to subscribe to Pod Appetit Gourmet Takes on your favorite podcatcher.